Roman roads Latin, v Romani IPA, WJJAE, R ma ne, singular, via Romana IPA, WJJA R ma na, meaning, Roman way were physical infrastructure vital to the maintenance and development of the Roman state, and were built from about 300 BC through the expansion and consolidation of the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire. They provided efficient means for the overland movement of armies, officials, and civilians, and the inland carriage of official communications and trade goods. Roman roads were of several kinds, ranging from small local roads to broad, long-distance highways built to connect cities, major towns and military bases. These major roads were often stone paved and metalled, cambered for drainage, and were flanked by footpaths, bridleways and drainage ditches. They were laid along accurately surveyed courses, and some were cut through hills, or conducted over rivers and ravines on bridgework. Sections could be supported over marshy ground on rafted or piled foundations. At the peak of Rome's development, no fewer than 29 great military highways radiated from the capital, and the late empire's 113 provinces were interconnected by 372 great roads. The whole comprised more than 400,000 kilometers, 250,000 miles of roads, of which over 80,500 kilometers, 50,000 miles were stone paved. In Gaul alone, no less than 21,000 kilometers, 13,000 miles of roadways are said to have been improved, and in Britain at least 4,000 kilometers, 2,500 miles. The courses and sometimes the surfaces of many Roman roads survived for millennia. Some are overlaid by modern roads. Topic: <laughs> Roman systems. Livy mentions some of the most familiar roads near Rome, and the milestones on them, at times long before the first paved road—the Appian Way. Unless these allusions are just simple anachronisms, the roads referred to were probably at the time little more than leveled earthen tracks. Thus, the Via Gabina during the time of Porcina is mentioned in about 500 BC, the Via Latina during the time of Coriolanus in about 490 BC, the Via Nomentana also known as Via Ficolensis. In 449 BC, the Via Labicana in 421 BC, and the Via Salaria in 361 BC in the itinerary of Antoninus, the description of the road system, after the death of Julius Caesar and during the tenure of Augustus, is as follows. With the exception of some outlying portions, such as Britain north of the Wall, Dacia, and certain provinces east of the Euphrates, the whole empire was penetrated by these itinera, plural of iter. There is hardly a district to which we might expect a Roman official to be sent, on service either civil or military, where we do not find roads. They reach the wall in Britain, run along the Rhine, the Danube, and the Euphrates, and cover, as with a network, the interior provinces of the empire." A road map of the empire reveals that it was generally laced with a dense network of prepared v. Beyond its borders there were no paved roads, however, it can be supposed that footpaths and dirt roads allowed some transport. There were, for instance, some pre-Roman ancient trackways in Britain, such as the Ridgeway and the Icknield Way. For specific roads, see Roman road locations below. <laughs> <laughs> Laws and traditions The laws of the Twelve Tables, dated to about 450 BC, required that any public road Latin via be 8 Roman feet perhaps about 2.37 meters wide where straight and twice that width where curved. These were probably the minimum widths for a via. In the later Republic, widths of around 12 Roman feet were common for public roads in rural regions, permitting the passing of two carts of standard four foot width without interference to pedestrian traffic. Actual practices varied from this standard. The tables command Romans to build public roads and give wayfarers the right to pass over private land where the road is in disrepair. Building roads that would not need frequent repair therefore became an ideological objective, as well as building them as straight as possible in order to build the narrowest roads possible, and thus save on material. Roman law defined the right to use a road as a servitus, or liability. The ius undi, right of going established a claim to use an iter, or footpath, across private land, the ius agendi, right of driving, an actus, or carriage track. A via combined both types of servitudes, provided it was of the proper width, which was determined by an arbiter. The default width was the latitudo legitima of 8 feet. 
Roman law and tradition forbade the use of vehicles in urban areas, except in certain cases. Married women and government officials on business could ride. The Lex Iulia Municipalis restricted commercial carts to nighttime access in the city within the walls and within a mile outside the walls. Types Roman roads varied from simple corduroy roads to paved roads using deep roadbeds of tamped rubble as an underlying layer to ensure that they kept dry, as the water would flow out from between the stones and fragments of rubble, instead of becoming mud in clay soils. According to Ulpian, there were three types of roads V. Publicae, consulares, praetorii or militares V. Privati, rustici, glarii or agrarii V. Vicinalis Topic. V. Publicae, consulares, praetorii and militares The first type of road included public high or main roads, constructed and maintained at the public expense, and with their soil vested in the state. Such roads led either to the sea, or to a town, or to a public river one with a constant flow, or to another public road. Siculus Flaccus, who lived under Trajan 98 calls them v. publicae regalesque, and describes their characteristics as follows. They are placed under curators commissioners, and repaired by redemptors contractors at the public expense, a fixed contribution, however, being levied from the neighboring landowners. These roads bear the names of their constructors e.g. via Appia, Cassia, Flaminia. Roman roads were named after the censor who had ordered their construction or reconstruction. The same person often served afterwards as consul, but the road name is dated to his term as censor. If the road was older than the office of censor or was of unknown origin, it took the name of its destination or of the region through which it mainly passed. A road was renamed if the censor ordered major work on it, such as paving, repaving, or rerouting. With the term V regales compare the roads of the Persian kings who probably organized the first system of public roads and the king's highway. With the term V militaria compare the Icnild Way e.g., Icen Hild Weg, or War Way of the Iceni. However, there were many other people, besides special officials, who from time to time, and for a variety of reasons, sought to connect their names with a great public service like that of the roads. Gaius Gracchus, when tribune of the people 123-122 BC, paved or graveled many of the public roads, and provided them with milestones and mounting blocks for riders. Again, Gaius Scribonius Curio, when Tribune 50 BC, sought popularity by introducing a Lex Viaria, under which he was to be chief inspector or commissioner for five years. Dio Cassius mentions as one of the forcible acts of the triumvirs of 43 BC Octavianus, Antony, and Lepidus, that they obliged the senators to repair the public roads at their own expense. <laughs> v. Privati, Rustici, Glarii and Agrarii The second category included private or country roads, originally constructed by private individuals, in whom their soil was vested, and who had the power to dedicate them to the public use. Such roads benefited from a right of way, in favor either of the public or of the owner of a particular estate. Under the heading of V. Privati were also included roads leading from the public or high roads to particular estates or settlements. These Ulpian considers to be public roads in themselves. Features off the via were connected to the via by V. Rustici, or secondary roads. Both main or secondary roads might either be paved, or left unpaved, with a gravel surface, as they were in North Africa. These prepared but unpaved roads were V. Glarii or Sternendae, to be strewn. Beyond the secondary roads were the V. Terranae, dirt roads. V. Vicinalis The third category comprised roads at or in villages, districts, or crossroads, leading through or towards a vicus or village. Such roads ran either into a high road, or into other v vicinalis, without any direct communication with a high road. They were considered public or private, according to the fact of their original construction out of public or private funds or materials. Such a road, though privately constructed, became a public road when the memory of its private constructors had perished. Siculus Flaccus describes V. Vicinalis as roads, de publicis quae divertunt in agros et sape ad alteras publicas pervenient, 
which turn off the public roads into fields, and often reach to other public roads. The repairing authorities, in this case, were the magistri pejorum or magistrates of the cantons. They could require the neighboring landowners either to furnish laborers for the general repair of the V. vicinalis, or to keep in repair, at their own expense, a certain length of road passing through their respective properties. Governance and financing With the conquest of Italy, prepared V were extended from Rome and its vicinity to outlying municipalities, sometimes overlying earlier roads. Building V was a military responsibility and thus came under the jurisdiction of a consul. The process had a military name, Via Munir, as though the Via were a fortification. Municipalities, however, were responsible for their own roads, which the Romans called V vicinalis. The beauty and grandeur of the roads might tempt us to believe that any Roman citizen could use them for free, but this was not the case. Tolls abounded, especially at bridges. Often they were collected at the city gate. Freight costs were made heavier still by import and export taxes. These were only the charges for using the roads. Costs of services on the journey went up from there. Financing road building was a Roman government responsibility. Maintenance, however, was generally left to the province. The officials tasked with fundraising were the curators viarum. They had a number of methods available to them. Private citizens with an interest in the road could be asked to contribute to its repair. High officials might distribute largesse to be used for roads. Censors, who were in charge of public morals and public works, were expected to fund repairs sua pecunia with their own money. Beyond those means, taxes were required. A via connected two cities. V were generally centrally placed in the countryside. The construction and care of the public roads, whether in Rome, in Italy, or in the provinces, was, at all periods of Roman history, considered to be a function of the greatest weight and importance. This is clearly shown by the fact that the censors, in some respects the most venerable of Roman magistrates, had the earliest paramount authority to construct and repair all roads and streets. Indeed, all the various functionaries, not excluding the emperors themselves, who succeeded the censors in this portion of their duties, may be said to have exercised a devolved censorial jurisdiction. Topic. Costs and civic responsibilities The devolution to the censorial jurisdictions soon became a practical necessity, resulting from the growth of the Roman dominions and the diverse labors which detained the censors in the capital city. Certain ad hoc official bodies successively acted as constructing and repairing authorities. In Italy, the censorial responsibility passed to the commanders of the Roman armies, and later to special commissioners, and in some cases perhaps to the local magistrates. In the provinces, the consul or praetor and his legates received authority to deal directly with the contractor. The care of the streets and roads within the Roman territory was committed in the earliest times to the censors. They eventually made contracts for paving the street inside Rome, including the Clivus Capitolinus, with lava, and for laying down the roads outside the city with gravel. Sidewalks were also provided. The aediles, probably by virtue of their responsibility for the freedom of traffic and policing the streets, co-operated with the censors and the bodies that succeeded them. It would seem that in the reign of Claudius AD 41-54 the quaestors had become responsible for the paving of the streets of Rome, or at least shared that responsibility with the quatuorviri viarum. It has been suggested that the quaestors were obliged to buy their right to an official career by personal outlay on the streets. There was certainly no lack of precedence for this enforced liberality, and the change made by Claudius may have been a mere change in the nature of the expenditure imposed on the quaestors. Topic: <laughs> Official bodies. The official bodies which first succeeded the censors in the care of the streets and roads were two in number. They were Quatuorviri viis in urba pergandis, with jurisdiction inside the walls of Rome. Duoviri viis extra urbum pergandis, with jurisdiction outside the walls. Both these bodies were probably of ancient origin, but the true year of their institution is unknown. Little reliance can be placed on Pomponius, who states that the quatuorviri were instituted eadem tempore at the same time as the praetor peregrinus, i.e., about 242 BC, and the decemviri litibus uticandis, time unknown. The first mention of either body occurs in the Lex Julia Municipalis of 45 BC. The quatuorviri were afterwards called quatuorviri viarum currendarum, 
The extent of jurisdiction of the duoviri is derived from their full title as duoviri vii's extra propius ve urbum romum passus mil pergandis. Their authority extended over all roads between their respective gates of issue in the city wall and the first milestone beyond. In case of an emergency in the condition of a particular road, men of influence and liberality were appointed, or voluntarily acted, as curators or temporary commissioners to superintend the work of repair. The dignity attached to such a curatorship is attested by a passage of Cicero. Among those who performed this duty in connection with particular roads was Julius Caesar, who became curator 67 BC of the Via Appia, and spent his own money liberally upon it. Certain persons appear also to have acted alone and taken responsibility for certain roads. In the country districts, as has been stated, the magistri pejorum had authority to maintain the viva senalis. In Rome itself each householder was legally responsible for the repairs to that portion of the street which passed his own house. It was the duty of the aediles to enforce this responsibility. The portion of any street which passed a temple or public building was repaired by the aediles at the public expense. When a street passed between a public building or temple and a private house, the public treasury and the private owner shared the expense equally. No doubt, if only to secure uniformity, the personal liability of householders to execute repairs of the streets was commuted for a paving rate payable to the public authorities who were responsible from time to time. <laughs> Augustus's changes The governing structure was changed by Augustus. In the course of his reconstitution of the urban administration he created new offices in connection with the public works, streets, and aqueducts of Rome. He found the quatuorviri and duoviri forming part of the body of magistrates known as vigentisexviri. These he reduced from 26 to 20 members but retained the quatuorviri among them. The latter were certainly still in existence under Hadrian 117-138. Augustus abolished the duoviri, no doubt because the time had come to deal comprehensively with the superintendents of the roads which connected Rome with Italy and the provinces. Dio Cassius relates that Augustus personally accepted the post of superintendent. In this capacity he represented the paramount authority which belonged originally to the censors. Moreover, he appointed men of praetorian rank to be road makers, assigning to each of them two lictors. He also made the office of curator of each of the great public roads a perpetual magistracy, instead of a special and temporary commission, as had been the case hitherto. In Augustus' capacity as supreme head of the public road system, he converted the temporary cura of each of the great roads into a permanent magistracy. The persons appointed under the new system were of senatorial or equestrian rank, according to the relative importance of the roads respectively assigned to them. It was the duty of each curator to issue contracts for the maintenance and repairs of his road, and to see that the contractor who undertook the work performed it faithfully, as to both quantity and quality. Moreover, he authorized the construction of sewers and removed obstructions to traffic, as the aediles did in Rome. It was in the character of an imperial curator, though probably of one armed with extraordinary powers, that Corbulo as has been already mentioned, denounced the magistratus and mancipes of the Italian roads to Tiberius. He pursued them and their families with fines and imprisonment for 18 years AD 21 and was rewarded with a consulship by Caligula, who was himself in the habit of condemning well-born citizens to work on the roads. It is noticeable that Claudius brought Corbulo to justice, and repaid the money which had been extorted from his victims. Other curators Special curators for a term seem to have been appointed on occasion, even after the institution of the permanent magistrates bearing that title. The emperors who succeeded Augustus exercised a vigilant control over the condition of the public highways. Their names occur frequently in the inscriptions to restorers of roads and bridges. Thus, Vespasian, Titus, Domitian, Trajan, and Septimius Severus were commemorated in this capacity at Emerita. The Itinerary of Antoninus, which was probably a work of much earlier date, republished in an improved and enlarged form, under one of the Antonin emperors, remains as standing evidence of the minute care which was bestowed on the service of the public roads. Construction and engineering Ancient Rome boasted impressive technological feats, using many advances that would be lost in the Middle Ages. 
These accomplishments would not be rivaled until the modern age. Many practical Roman innovations were adopted from earlier designs. Some of the common, earlier designs incorporated arches. Topic. Practices and terminology Roman road builders aimed at a regulation width see laws and traditions above, but actual widths have been measured at between 3.6 feet .1 meters and more than 23 feet meters. Today, the concrete has worn from the spaces around the stones, giving the impression of a very bumpy road, but the original practice was to produce a surface that was no doubt much closer to being flat. Many roads were built to resist rain, freezing and flooding. They were constructed to need as little repair as possible. Roman construction took a directional straightness. Many long sections are ruler straight, but it should not be thought that all of them were. Some links in the network were as long as 55 miles 89 kilometers. Gradients of 10% to 12% are known in ordinary terrain, 15% to 20% in mountainous country. The Roman emphasis on constructing straight roads often resulted in steep slopes relatively impractical for most commercial traffic. Over the years the Romans themselves realized this and built longer, but more manageable, alternatives to existing roads. Roman roads generally went straight up and down hills, rather than in a serpentine pattern. As to the standard imperial terminology that was used, the words were localized for different elements used in construction and varied from region to region. Also, in the course of time, the terms via manita and via publica became identical. Topic. Materials and methods V were distinguished not only according to their public or private character, but according to the materials employed and the methods followed in their construction. Ulpian divided them up in the following fashion. Via terrena, a plain road of leveled earth. Via Glariata, an earthed road with a graveled surface. Via Manita, a regular built road, paved with rectangular blocks of the stone of the country, or with polygonal blocks of lava. The Romans, though certainly inheriting some of the art of road construction from the Etruscans, borrowed the knowledge of construction of V Muniti from the Carthaginians according to Isidore of Sevilla. <laughs> via Terrena The V. Terrene were plain roads of leveled earth. These were mere tracks worn down by the feet of humans and animals, and possibly by wheeled carriages. Topic. Via Glariata The V. Glariati were earthed roads with a graveled surface or a gravel subsurface and paving on top. Livy speaks of the censors of his time as being the first to contract for paving the streets of Rome with flint stones, for laying gravel on the roads outside the city, and for forming raised footpaths at the sides. In these roads, the surface was hardened with gravel, and although pavements were introduced shortly afterwards, the blocks were allowed to rest merely on a bed of small stones. An example of this type is found on the Prenestine Way. Another example is found near the Via Latina. Topic. Via Manita The best sources of information as regards the construction of a regulation via Manita are the many existing remains of V. Publicae. These are often sufficiently well preserved to show that the rules of construction were, as far as local material allowed, minutely adhered to in practice. The directions for making pavements given by Vitruvius. The pavement and the Via Manita were identical in construction, except as regards the top layer, or surface. This consisted, in the former case, of marble or mosaic, and, in the latter, of blocks of stone or lava. A passage in Statius describing the repairs of the Via Domitiana, a branch road of the Via Appia, leading to Neapolis, after the civil engineer looked over the site of the proposed road and determined roughly where it should go, the agrimensors went to work surveying the road bed. They used two main devices, the rod and a device called a grama, which helped them obtain right angles. The gromatici, the Roman equivalent of rod men, placed rods and put down a line called the rigor. As they did not possess anything like a transit, a civil engineering surveyor tried to achieve straightness by looking along the rods and commanding the gromatici to move them as required. Using the grome they then laid out a grid on the plan of the road. The libertors then began their work using plows and, sometimes with the help of legionaries, with spades excavated the road bed down to bed rock or at least to the firmest ground they could find. The excavation was called the fossa, the Latin word for ditch. 
The depth varied according to terrain. The method varied according to geographic locality, materials available and terrain, but the plan, or ideal at which the engineer aimed was always the same. The roadbed was layered. The road was constructed by filling the ditch. This was done by layering rock over other stones. Into the ditch was dumped large amounts of rubble, gravel and stone, whatever fill was available. Sometimes a layer of sand was put down, if it could be found. When it came to within one yard one meter or so of the surface it was covered with gravel and tamped down, a process called pavier, or pavimentaire. The flat surface was then the pavimentum. It could be used as the road, or additional layers could be constructed. A statuman or foundation of flat stone set in cement might support the additional layers. The final steps utilized lime-based concrete, which the Romans had discovered. They seem to have mixed the mortar and the stones in the ditch. First a small layer of coarse concrete, the rudis, then a little layer of fine concrete, the nucleus, went onto the pavement or statuman. Into or onto the nucleus went a course of polygonal or square paving stones, called the summa crusta. The crusta was crowned for drainage. An example is found in an early basalt road by the Temple of Saturn on the Clivus Capitolinus. It had travertine paving, polygonal basalt blocks, concrete bedding substituted for the gravel, and a rain water gutter. Topic. Obstacle crossings Romans preferred to engineer solutions to obstacles rather than circumvent them. Outcroppings of stone, ravines, or hilly or mountainous terrain called for cuttings and tunnels. An example of this is found on the Roman road from Cazanes near the Iron Gates. This road was half carved into the rock, about 5 feet, to 5 feet. 9 in, 1.5 to 1.75 meters, the rest of the road, above the Danube, was made from wooden structure, projecting out of the cliff. The road functioned as a towpath, making the Danube navigable. Tabula Traiana memorial plaque in Serbia is all that remains of the now submerged road. Topic. Bridges and causeways Roman bridges, built by ancient Romans, were the first large and lasting bridges built. River crossings were achieved by bridges, or pontes. Single slabs went over rills. A bridge could be of wood, stone, or both. Wooden bridges were constructed on pilings sunk into the river, or on stone piers. Larger or more permanent bridges required arches. These larger bridges were built with stone and had the arch as its basic structure see arch bridge. Most also used concrete, which the Romans were the first to use for bridges. Roman bridges were so well constructed that a number remain in use today. Causeways were built over marshy ground. The road was first marked out with pilings. Between them were sunk large quantities of stone so as to raise the causeway to more than 5 feet meters above the marsh. In the provinces, the Romans often did not bother with a stone causeway, but used log roads pontes longi. Topic. Military and citizen utilization The public road system of the Romans was thoroughly military in its aims and spirit. It was designed to unite and consolidate the conquests of the Roman people, whether within or without the limits of Italy proper. A legion on the march brought its own baggage train impedimenta and constructed its own camp castra every evening at the side of the road. Topic. Milestones and markers Milestones divided the Via Appia even before 250 BC into numbered miles, and most V after 124 BC. The modern word, mile, derives from the Latin milia passum, 1,000 paces, which amounted to 4,841 feet 1, a milestone, or miliarium, was a circular column on a solid rectangular base, set for more than 2 feet .61 meters into the ground, standing 5 feet .5 meters tall, 20 inches 51 centimeters in diameter, and weighing more than 2 tons. At the base was inscribed the number of the mile relative to the road it was on. In a panel at eye height was the distance to the Roman Forum and various other information about the officials who made or repaired the road and when. These milleria are valuable historical documents now. Their inscriptions are collected in the volume 17 of the Corpus Inscriptionum Latinarum. 
The Romans had a preference for standardization wherever possible, so Augustus, after becoming permanent commissioner of Rhodes in 20 BC, set up the Miliarium Aurium golden milestone", near the Temple of Saturn. All roads were considered to begin from this gilded bronze monument. On it were listed all the major cities in the empire and distances to them. Constantine called it the Umbilicus Romae, naval of Rome, and built a similar, although more complex, monument in Constantinople, the Milion. Milestones permitted distances and locations to be known and recorded exactly. It was not long before historians began to refer to the milestone at which an event occurred. Topic: <inaudible> Itinerary maps and charts. Combined topographical and road maps may have existed as specialty items in some Roman libraries, but they were expensive, hard to copy and not in general use. Travelers wishing to plan a journey could consult an itinerarium, which in its most basic form was a simple list of cities and towns along a given road, and the distances between them. It was only a short step from lists to a master list, or a schematic route planner in which roads and their branches were represented more or less in parallel, as in the Tabula Pudingeriana. From this master list, parts could be copied and sold on the streets. The most thorough used different symbols for cities, way stations, water courses, and so on. The Roman government from time to time would produce a master road itinerary. The first known were commissioned in 44 BC by Julius Caesar and Mark Antony. Three Greek geographers, Xenodoxus, Theodotus and Polyclitus, were hired to survey the system and compile a master itinerary. The task required over 25 years and the resulting stone engraved master itinerary was set up near the Pantheon. Travelers and itinerary sellers could make copies from it. Topic. Vehicles and transportation Outside the cities, Romans were avid riders and rode on or drove quite a number of vehicle types, some of which are mentioned here. Carts driven by oxen were used. Horse-drawn carts could travel up to 40 to 50 kilometers, 25 to 31 miles per day. Pedestrians 20 to 25 kilometers, 12 to 16 miles. For purposes of description, Roman vehicles can be divided into the car, the coach, and the cart. Cars were used to transport one or two individuals, coaches were used to transport parties, and carts to transport cargo. Of the cars, the most popular was the carus, a standard chariot form descending to the Romans from a greater antiquity. The top was open, the front closed. One survives in the Vatican. It carried a driver and a passenger. A carus with two horses was a biga, three horses, a triga, and four horses a quadriga. The tires were of iron. When not in use, its wheels were removed for easier storage. A more luxurious version, the carpentum, transported women and officials. It had an arched overhead covering of cloth and was drawn by mules. A lighter version, the Sisium, equivalent to a gig, was open above and in front and had a seat. Drawn by one or two mules or horses, it was used for cab work, the cab drivers being called Sisiani. The builder was a Cisarius. Of the coaches, the mainstay was the Reda or Reda, which had four wheels. The high sides formed a sort of box in which seats were placed, with a notch on each side for entry. It carried several people with baggage up to the legal limit of 1,000 Roman libre pounds, modern equivalent 328 kilograms 723 pounds. It was drawn by teams of oxen, horses or mules. A cloth top could be put on for weather, in which case it resembled a covered wagon. The reda was probably the main vehicle for travel on the roads. Rede meritorii were hired coaches. The fiscalis reda was a government coach. The driver and the builder were both referred to as a radarius. Of the carts, the main one was the plostrum or plostrum. This was simply a platform of boards attached to wheels and a cross tree. The wheels, or tympana, were solid and were several centimeters inches thick. The sides could be built up with boards or rails. A large wicker basket was sometimes placed on it. A two-wheel version existed along with the normal four-wheel type called the plostrum mias. The military used a standard wagon. Their transportation service was the cursus clabularis, after the standard wagon, called a carus clabularius, clabularis, clabularis, or clabulare. It transported the impedimenta baggage of a military column. Topic. Way stations and traveler inns 
Non-military officials and people on official business had no legion at their service and the government maintained way stations, or mansiones, staying places, for their use. Passports were required for identification. Mansiones were located about 25 to 30 kilometers 16 to 19 miles apart. There the official traveler found a complete villa dedicated to his use. Often a permanent military camp or a town grew up around the mansio. For non-official travelers in need of refreshment, a private system of inns or kapanai were placed near the mansiones. They performed the same functions but were somewhat disreputable, as they were frequented by thieves and prostitutes. Graffiti decorate the walls of the few whose ruins have been found. Genteel travelers needed something better than kapanai. In the early days of the V, when little unofficial provision existed, houses placed near the road were required by law to offer hospitality on demand. Frequented houses no doubt became the first tabernae, which were hostels, rather than the taverns we know today. As Rome grew, so did its tabernae, becoming more luxurious and acquiring good or bad reputations as the case may be. One of the best hotels was the Tabernae Cadiciae at Sinuessa on the Via Appia. It had a large storage room containing barrels of wine, cheese and ham. Many cities of today grew up around a taberna complex, such as Rheinsabern in the Rhineland, and Severnae in Alsace. A third system of way stations serviced vehicles and animals, the mutationes, changing stations. They were located every 20 to 30 kilometers, 12 to 19 miles. In these complexes, the driver could purchase the services of wheelwrights, cartwrights, and aquari medici, or veterinarians. Using these stations in chariot relays, the Emperor Tiberius hastened 296 kilometers 184 miles in 24 hours to join his brother, Drusus Germanicus, who was dying of gangrene as a result of a fall from a horse. Topic. Post offices and services Two postal services were available under the empire, one public and one private. The Cursus Publicus, founded by Augustus, carried the mail of officials by relay throughout the Roman road system. The vehicle for carrying mail was a sisium with a box, but for special delivery, a horse and rider was faster. On average, a relay of horses could carry a letter 80 kilometers 50 miles in a day. The postman wore a characteristic leather hat, the pettinus. The postal service was a somewhat dangerous occupation, as postmen were a target for bandits and enemies of Rome. Private mail of the well-to-do was carried by Tabellary, an organization of slaves available for a price. Topic. Locations There are many examples of roads that still follow the route of Roman roads. Topic. Italian areas. Major roads via Emilia, from Rimini Ariminum to Placentia Via Appia, the Appian Way 312 BC, from Rome to Apulia Via Aurelia 241 BC, from Rome to France Via Cassia, from Rome to Tuscany Via Flaminia 220 BC, from Rome to Rimini Ariminum. Via Raetia, from Verona north across the Brenner Pass Via Salaria, from Rome to the Adriatic Sea in the marches others via Emilia Scari 109 BC Via Aquilia, branches off the Appia at Capua to the sea at Vibo Via Amarina, from Rome to Emilia and Perusia Via Canalis, from Udine, G. E. Mona and Val Canali to Viloc in Carinthia and then over Alps to Salzburg or Vienna Via Claudia Julia Augusta 13 BC Via Claudia Nova 47 AD Via Clodia, from Rome to Tuscany forming a system with the Cassia Via Domitiana, coast road from Naples to Formia Via Flavia, from Trieste to Dalmatia Via Gemina, from Aquileia and Trieste through the Karst to Materia, Obrov, Lipa and Klana, from where, near Rijeka, descending towards Trsat Tersatica, to continue along the Dalmatian coast Via Julia Augusta 8 BC, exits Aquileia Via Labicana, southeast from Rome, forming a system with the Prenestina Via Ostiensis, from Rome to Ostia Via Postumia 148 BC, from Aquileia through Verona across the Apennines to Genoa 
Via Papilia 132 BC, two distinct roads, one from Capua to Regium and the other from Ariminum through the later Veneto region Via Prinestina, from Rome to Prinestae Via Slavonia, from Aquileia across northern Istria to Senj and into Dalmatia Via Severiana, Terracina to Ostia Via Tibertina, from Rome to Aeternum Via Traiana Nova, Italy, from Lake Bolsena to the Via Cassia. Known by archaeology only Other areas Africa Main road, from Sala Colonia to Carthage to Alexandria. In Egypt, via Hadriana. In Mauritania Tingitana from Tingus southward see, Roman roads in Morocco. Albania, Republic of Macedonia, Greece, Turkivia Ignatia 146 BC connecting Dyrrhachium on Adriatic Sea to Byzantium via Thessaloniki Istria, Serbia, Bulgaria, Turkivia Militaris via Diagonalis, via Singidunum, connecting Middle Europe and Byzantium Roman road in Cilicia in South Turkey France in France, a Roman road is called Voie Romaine in vernacular language. Via Agrippa Via Aquitania, from Narbonne, where it connected to the Via Domitia, to the Atlantic Ocean across Toulouse and Bordeaux Via Domitia 118 BC, from Nimes to the Pyrenees, where it joins to the Via Augusta at the Col de Panissars Voie Romaine, extending from Dunkirk to Castle in Nord département Germania Inferior Germany, Belgium, Netherlands via Belgica Boulogne Cologne Lower Limes Germanicus Interconnections between Lower Limes Germanicus and Via Belgica Middle East via Maris Via Traiana Nova Petra Roman Road 1st century Petra Jordan Romania Trajan's Bridge and Iron Gates Road Via Traiana Porolissum Napoca Potisa Apollum Road Via Pontica, Trosmis Pyroboridova Caput Stenarum Apollum Partiscum Lugioromania, Bulgaria via Pontica, Spain and Portugal. Eater Ab Emerita Asturicam, from Sevilla to Gijon. Later known as Via de la Plata, Plata means silver in Spanish, but in this case it is a false cognate of an Arabic word balada, part of the fan of the way of St. James. Now it is the A66 freeway. Via Augusta, from Cadiz to the Pyrenees, where it joins to the Via Domitia at the Col de Panissars, near La Jonquera. It passes through Valencia, Tarragona anciently Terraco, and Barcelona. Camino de Oro, ending in Orense, capital of the province of Orense, passing near the village of Rebolido, Siria Road connecting Antioch and Chalchi. Strata Diocletiana, along the Limes Arabicus, going through Palmyra and Damascus, and south to Arabia, trans-alpine roads These roads connected modern Italy and Germany. Via Claudia Augusta 47 from Altinum now Cordo Dedino to Augsburg via the Russian Pass Via Mala from Milan to Lindau via the San Bernardino Pass Via Decia Trans-Pyrenean roads connecting Hispania and Gallia A flat Asturica Berdigilam United Kingdom Aikman Street Camlet Way Deer Street Ermine Street Fen Causeway Fosse Way King Street London West of England Roman Roads Petters Way Pie Road Stain Street Chichester Stain Street Colchester Stangate Via Devana Watling Street Topic. References Topic. Footnotes Topic. General information Topic. Primary sources Topic. Further reading Adams, Colin, 2007. Land Transport in Roman Egypt 30 BC AD 300, A Study in Administration and Economic History. Oxford, Oxford Univ. Press. Corelli, Filippo, 2007. Rome and Environs, An Archaeological Guide. Berkeley, Univ. of California Press. Davies, Hugh, E. H. 1998. Designing Roman Roads. Britannia, Journal of Romano-British and Kindred Studies 29-1-16. Erdkamp, Peter. 
Hunger and the Sword, Warfare and Food Supply in Roman Republican Wars 264 BC. Amsterdam, Gieben, 1998. Isaac, Benjamin, 1988. The Meaning of Limes and Limitine in Ancient Sources. Journal of Roman Studies 78-125-47. MacDonald, William L. 1982-1986. The Architecture of the Roman Empire, 2 vols. Yale Publications in the History of Art 17, 35. New Haven, Connecticut, Yale Univ. Press. Meyer, Fick J., and O. Van Nijf, 1992. Trade, Transport and Society in the Ancient World, a Sourcebook. London, Routledge. O'Connor, Colin, 1993. Roman Bridges. Cambridge, UK, Cambridge Univ. Press. Lawrence, Ray, 1999. The Roads of Roman Italy. Mobility and Cultural Change. London, Routledge. Lewis, Michael J. T. 2001. Surveying Instruments of Greece and Rome. Cambridge, UK, Cambridge Univ. Press. Quilici, Lorenzo, 2008. Land Transport, Part 1, Roads and Bridges. In the Oxford Handbook of Engineering and Technology in the Classical World. Edited by John P. Olson, 551-79. New York, Oxford Univ. Press. Talbert, Richard J. A., et al., 2000. Barrington Atlas of the Greek and Roman World. Princeton, N.J., Princeton Univ. Press. Wiseman, T. P. 1970. Roman Republican Road Building. Papers of the British School at Rome 38-122-52. Topic. External links Maps General articles Road descriptions Roman law regarding public and private domain Road construction